Welcome to the future. I'm Murray Clayton. I'm here to show you that success can be redefined and doesn't have to come at the cost of self. I'd like to talk to you guys a little bit about my very first crime scene investigation uh, when I was still a forensic anthropologist in training. Um, and, you know, the call took me to rural Ontario, somewhere out in the west, a little small town. And uh, the thing is, it happened on Halloween. And the crime itself was a domestic assault that had turned into a homicide and a suicide and an arson that had leveled a three-story home right down to the basement. This was it. This, were, this was the big leagues, and this was the real deal. And let me tell you, I was so excited about being something, part of something finally bigger than myself that I had to physically pull myself aside and wipe that smile off my face for professionalism's sake. But as I got to work, I started to realize that there was a cost, a cost to someone else's irrationality and selfish decision-making, the decision to take a life, the decision to destroy a home, and the decision to escape prosecution by a suicide. Uh, much like that case, and this talk kind of gets really heavy really fast. But the more cases I've worked on, and the more I studied, the more I realized that every decision we make has the potential to have an enormous impact on the world around us. The thing is, our moral compass and our ethical decision-making process changes all the time based on how the world is changing around us. And like we saw before, we are on the verge of a global, social, economic, political, maybe now medical tipping point. So, with that kind of pressure, how can we be sure that we're ever making the right choice? I'm proposing an ethical toolkit that consists of four considerations, or tools, that are meant to guide and ease the decision-making process. Developed based on my experiences and with some collaboration from other professionals, um, this toolkit really is meant to build the vision that we see in the future wherein ethical decision-making, although sometimes difficult, at least can be made with a clear conscience. And we all have our decisions to make. As a forensic scientist, the day-to-day -day work, owning up to a mistake that I make could lead to the loss of my own credibility or my reputation. But there's another cost, because if I don't admit that mistake, it could lead to a miscarriage of justice by which, of course, I mean an innocent person getting put in jail or a guilty person being set free. So my ethical dilemma then, hypothetically, could be choosing between my career and someone else's freedom. If we step outside of my bubble, there might be ethical choices that you could be thinking about in your day-to-day -day lives. Maybe as a student, academic integrity or dishonesty, perhaps how we navigate our social media presence online, dealing or navigating a toxic work environment or a dishonest boss. How about the way we treat people during the midst of a global health scare? Seems pretty relevant, right? Now, you're going to have questions like, how do I make these tools work for me? Or how do they give me these answers? And unfortunately, I cannot provide that response to you, because the thing with ethical theory is that it is dynamic, and it offers approaches, not solutions. So while I cannot give you your answers, at least you might be able to get some clarity when dealing with a situation. The first tool I'm proposing is your own independence. And being independent means being able to make autonomous decisions without the fear of losing your job, and without the threat to your own safety. Threats to independence typically come from higher authority, like your boss, or a manager, CEO, director. In my case, it might come from the police, or maybe even the government. And lapses in independent judgment come most commonly during times of war, especially for medical personnel, who have both a dual role as healer, 
but also military officer. So when they cannot execute their own independent moral choices, they risk not only harm to their own psychological health, but also the threat of losing their license or even being charged with a war crime. U.S. doctors and nurses in Guantanamo Bay were accused of torturing prisoners, but they cite extreme and direct pressure from the commanders in charge to make those decisions, thereby removing them from what they know as their own independent moral choices. In World War II, doctors were ordered to give precious antibiotics not to the soldiers dying of life-threatening pneumonia, but rather to soldiers with sexually transmitted infections. Why is this? Well, because the soldiers with STIs could heal up quicker and then head right back out to the battlefront, whereas the soldiers with pneumonia subsequently died. So it's important to just take a second, think about what you would do in that situation. You've been given a direct order from your superior that you know is going to lead to the harm or possibly the death of other individuals. But you have a higher chance of winning that war. Now, acknowledging tricky situations like this really are a stepping stone towards larger discussions about the ability to be independent. But if we can take for granted that we are truly independent, then we can start to think about our next tool, which is personal virtue. And personal virtue is your measure of what makes you a strong mind and a strong character, and essentially a good person. You can start easily by asking questions like, am I a good person? How do I become a good person? Am I good at my job? How do I be better? Or you can focus in with actual virtues like effort, empathy, compassion, honesty. These may be virtues that you're striving to achieve. As a forensic scientist, I see issues of virtue rooted in notions like truth and impartiality, but also good moral character. Now, you might be wondering, who the heck cares about my character? If science is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, shouldn't that be enough? Well, yes and no. Because for true science to actually be credible, it has to be interpreted by someone who is reputable and trustworthy, and also competent. Now, it's important to know that you can be successful without sacrificing your personal virtues. So, for instance, doctors who take the Hippocratic Oath, I swear to do no harm, they're not just looking at being technically proficient and extremely skilled, we, we hope they are, but we also hope that they have compassion and empathy something that makes them a doctor with good bedside manner. This is what completes that package of success. So, really, you know, we're doing all right. We're building a good person here. But you do have more help. And that comes in the form of an ethical framework, which is a blueprint to help guide how you're going to be building that decision-making process. So just by a show of hands, how many people here have ever heard of the trolley problem? Okay, good, good. That's more than I usually get. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the trolley problem, it's an ethical thought experiment in which you must imagine a runaway train or trolley on a track, and it's about to hit five people. You have the power to pull a switch and reroute that track so it only hits one person, right? So you have a choice to make. How many of you, just again, by a show of hands, would pull that switch? Oh, half a person went, oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, so some people are thinking, okay, maybe I would pull that switch. So what you're actually demonstrating is a utilitarian framework where consequences matter. And I'm guessing that most of you said you'd pull that switch because sacrificing one life, maybe that's okay if you can save a whole bunch more, right? How many of you would not touch that switch? Okay. Brave, yeah, even <laughs> back there as well. Awesome. So what you guys are demonstrating is what we call a duty-based framework, which really you're assessing the active agency of causing someone's death. 
versus being a passive observer of something that might just happen anyway, right? So two very different approaches. And there really is no one answer to that, other than the fact that you guys are all complicit in murder now. But it's just an example of the two different ways that we could approach a situation. Another example would be a medical ethical framework. So remember that Hippocratic Oath, I swear to do no harm? That is actually the medical framework for ethics that all doctors and nurses subscribe to. It's paramount. And uh, it essentially, it leads their behavior no matter what other ethical framework follows. And really, it's good to know that there are hundreds of ethical frameworks out there, each suited for different situations. And a, a simple Google search of your discipline plus ethical framework will actually provide you with one that might be right for your profession. So to recap, we have independence, we have personal virtue, and we have an ethical framework. Now, how do we know that those tools are actually right for the job that we're doing? Well, that's because your employer should be providing you that last tool, a professional code of conduct. And a code of conduct sets the standards of excellence and really codifies the principles and the values and the duties of the job that you're trying to get done. At the University of Toronto Mississauga, in the Forensic Science program, we train our students in ethics and professionalism starting with the university's very own code of conduct. So they know exactly how to be a moral citizen in the academic world. Now, for a code of conduct to be useful and successful, it has to be accessible and it has to be respected. Now, by accessible, I don't just mean how easy is it to get to, but do you even understand it? Do you understand the language in it? And are the scenarios outlined even relevant to the type of job that you want to do? And by respected, I mean not only respected by members outside of the organization, but respected by members inside of the organization. Because if you don't respect your own code of conduct, then you're leaving yourself open to questionable, questionable behavior and unethical acts without knowing right from wrong. Now, when using these tools, it's a really good idea to take a step back and think about how each one might actually apply to you. So remember that case that I talked about at the beginning, my Halloween homicide. Well, believe it or not, there are actually ethical implications to having a trainee on the field, like I was at the time. Issues of competency, security, privacy. Luckily for me, I was afforded my own independence to execute my skills that I had trained for. And although I was supervised, I still had to make sure that there was no pressure from the police or from the fire marshal to influence my work and find evidence that fit the narrative of what they think happened before we had the actual conclusion. The personal virtues that I try to strive for include professionalism and self-control. And this is really what helped me step back, get over the excitement of being at a case, and get to work and do it right. In addition to that, the personal virtue of responsibility really helped me to appreciate the gravity of the situation and to keep going despite the fact that it was very emotionally charged and that we worked well into the darkness of the night. The ethical framework that I choose to subscribe to is from the American Anthropologists Association that dictates the uh, respect of human remains above all other values and providing for the safety and dignity and privacy of humans that I work with, be they alive or dead. This is what guides my behavior and lets me know what is the most important thing at a crime scene to take care of. And lastly, the code of conduct that was given to me by the Canadian Society for Forensic Science lets me know that some of the values and standards can change the choices I make. For instance, it lets me know that standing here today telling you, a guys, telling you guys about this case is okay because it's for the purposes of education and awareness. But it also lets me know that it's not okay to tell you all the juicy details about that crime that haven't been disclosed for the purpose of giving you a thrill, right? 
That's a choice that I need to make. And we all have a choice. When you uh, can use your own personal values, you can really think about the way in which what you do influences the world around you. If an ethical toolkit like this one can be at the heart of all professional training, then we can be proud to be responsible for not only the failures, but also the successes of the community around us. And you can build the future that you see in your vision. Thank you.